Okay, brilliant. Um, let's make a start. Welcome everyone and thanks for coming to this fourth and final in the series of new economics briefings on how we can resist an avalanche of evictions. My name's Heather. I work for the New Economics Foundation as an organiser and I've been organising with private tenants in East London for the past um, eight, nine years. For those of you who don't know who NEF are, uh, we're a think tank working on building a new economy for people and the planet. Um, it's really, really exciting to see so many people on the call tonight, particularly at this real crunch moment for those of us who are precariously housed. We're just going to go through a few admin things really quickly. Um, so firstly, lots of you have already been doing this. Um, please do say who you are and where you're calling from and which group you're from in the chat box. Um, you can tweet about the briefing using the hashtag NEF briefing. Um, after this week, we're going to be taking a bit of a break with these briefings and we're going to be coming back then um, at the autumn statement. Uh, so if you're not signed up to our mailing list already, then please do um, so we can stay connected as a movement. And one of my colleagues is going to be posting the link to how you can sign up to the mailing list in the chat box now. Right, so it's been a hell of a week for renters and for renter groups. Um, last week, and I know lots of you will have, will have been involved in this, the government buckled to pressure from renters unions, housing charities, medical institutions, um, and announced a temporary extension to the ban on evictions. So that's now been extended to the 20th of September. Um, let's not pretend that that solves the problem. Let's not pretend that that's gonna avert the impending evictions crisis. Um, but I would say that the work of trying to force the government to recognize housing as a basic human need is really hard. So we do need to take this moment and just feel that victory, at least for a moment. Um, Everyone on this call, though, knows that unless other reforms follow and unless we find ways to protect one another and our neighbours from evictions, then the extension to this ban just kicks the can down the road. Um, many, many thousands of renters have already been issued with eviction notices. Um, people who have lost income under COVID and haven't been able to pay their rent. The government have told us that we should rely on the kindness of landlords um, and we should rely on their leniency and reasonableness. Uh, I mean, I would say as someone that's been evicted from my home twice, this makes me absolutely furious, this sort of false naivety on the, on the part of the government that landlords are all of a sudden going to start acting with leniency. Uh, and meanwhile, um, families are more families than than ever have been for the last 14 years are living in absolutely appalling temporary accommodation that is making them sick. Um, but we do have an extra month before eviction proceedings are going to start happening. And I would say let's use that month. Um, let's use that month to organise. The government has shown that they are susceptible to pressure and the anti-evictions movement has shown that it can win, right? So um, now is no time to be timid in our demands or in the action that we take. Here are some of the questions that, for, from my perspective, I think we need to be asking now. How do we build on the government's concession of last week and how do we push for more transformative change in the housing system? What demands should we be making over the next four weeks and what's our strategy to win? Um, and lastly, how can we organise our communities to fight against evictions? I was chatting to Sean from Living Rent earlier today and he was telling me that they're already aware of landlords who don't want to wait, um, just going in there and doing illegal evictions. So, you know, government reforms are not always going to cut it because uh, landlords are taking the law into their own hands. Um, so we've got five very, very knowledgeable and experienced um, guests with us tonight. First of all, we're going to hear from an extra special surprise guest, Joe Bezik, who's head of housing and land at the New Economics Foundation. And Joe's going to give us a bit of big picture as to what last week's announcement means for the fight against evictions and what, what we might expect to happen next. Um, then we're going to hear from Nabila, who's a member of Acorn's Sheffield branch. Um, Nabila's going to talk about her own experience as a renter and outline some of the tactics that Acorn are using um, and how you can get involved. 
Then we're going to hear Izzy from Housing Actions Southwark and Lambeth. Um, Izzy is going to share her experience as someone who has been fighting evictions um, from many years before the pandemic and what skills and techniques we might be able to learn from her. Um, then we're going to hear from Jane, who's the CEO and founder of the Magpie Project. Uh, Jane will provide a picture of what life is like for those people who are already homeless and in temporary accommodation and how all this intersects with migration and race. Um, finally, we're going to hear from Sean from the Edinburgh Member Defence Team of Living Rent in Scotland and Sean's going to give us a bit of context as to what's happening in Scotland and what demands and tactics they're going to be using over the next few weeks. Um, so throughout the meeting, we're going to be trying to draw out different um, things that we can be doing over the next four weeks. But we also really, really want to hear from you. I mean, it was really amazing to see the people um, and the, the breadth of groups, people that we have on the call tonight. So we also want to hear from you and what your groups and unions are doing. Um, and please do post any calls to action that you might have in the chat box and, and we'll, we will do our best to shout them out. Um, Likewise, as the speakers are talking, please do post any questions that you've got in the chat box. Um, we might not be able to get around them all uh, because we need to finish at eight, but we will do our best. Um, brilliant. OK, let's move on to our first speaker. So Joe uh, Bezik is the head of housing and land at NEF. Um, Joe, thanks very much for joining us last minute. Uh, we were really interested in, in your thoughts on what this got. So why did it happen? What might happen next? Um, and what are some of the key policy changes that you think that we should be fighting for over the next month? Thanks, Heather. Um, good evening, everyone. Yeah, we, we thought it was maybe a good idea to just for me just for a few minutes um, at the beginning. I mean, many of you will be already aware of this stuff, but just to talk through what what the government has and hasn't done for renters during during the pandemic um, and, you know, why we're in the situation uh, that we are. Uh, so, you know, as, as, as will be like, you know, incredibly obvious to everyone, uh, a global pandemic and the demand on, you know, almost everyone for a long, long time to like stay home, like, you know, puts the need for a secure, um, affordable, safe place to live like front and centre. And it's a need that we know is not met for millions of people in the so the government, you know, did recognise this pretty quickly and after, you know, an initial stumble, they, they, they basically suspended uh, evictions or they put what, what's called a stay on evictions. So um, with, with, you know, with, people were evicted during the pandemic legally, but legally it was not possible to be evicted from, from your tenancy uh, during the pandemic. Uh, and then they basically forgot about renters for a long time, didn't do, uh, didn't do very much at all. There was some minor change of rent debt front, which I'll come to in a second. They forgot about renters for a long time and so, until, you know, the, the voices from the housing movement and the renters movement became deafening. And at the 11th hour in June, I think it was, they then extended that um, stay on evictions. And again, and then did exactly the same thing, but even, you know, like more recklessly and dramatically again and so it really looked as we were coming up to the 21st day on evictions was going to end with absolutely no plan for what to do about all the renters who are going to then then be uh, served with eviction notices or who had already been served with eviction notices then going to be liable for eviction at the, at the absolute um, 11th hour um, the government then did uh, ex have extended it again by another month. So we're talking uh, the middle of September when the eviction ban uh, is, go is going to be lifted again. And they, did, and they did one other thing, which is, you know, potentially quite significant, which is extend the period uh, of notice that a tenant needs to receive to be evicted to six months. Uh, maybe we'll pick this discussion up later, but some people are talking about that as, as, as technically an end to what's called Section 21 no-fault evictions. The Section 21 no-fault evictions are a bit of a, an anomaly in the UK. Most vast majority of countries in Europe don't have them. And it means that a landlord can evict you without any fault for any reason, uh, giving very little notice. Um, but for, for technical reasons, it's thought that this... And the 
to ending these, but for technical reasons, it's thought that potentially this six month notice period um, will will end section 21 evictions. But all they've really done again is, is kick the can and they're not addressing head on the primary issue, which we're um, you, we're going to one of the primary issues we're going to be talking about tonight, which is rent debt. We're obviously, as you all know, entering um, what's forecast to be the the you know biggest recession in the history of the world, um, and renters who are generally in society not um, all a particularly well off bunch, many of whom have been furloughed, lost income, lost jobs, or will go on to do so as a result of the recession, are going to be some of the people who are going to find it harder and harder to meet their costs. Um, the government has been sticking its head in the sand, has done exception, exceptionally little about this. They've obviously recognised that it is a problem because that's why they, they put the stay on, uh, on evictions, but they, aren't, they haven't actually brought forward any policies to do anything about it. So one of the things I'd be really interested to hear about you tonight is about what policies we should be pushing for um, in, ter in terms of rent debt. Um, basically, you know, we need to find a way of, of in some way cancelling rent debt. Presumably that means that the government is going to have to play some, play some role in, in paying more rent or historic rent than it currently does. But also presumably we want landlords who, you know, generally better off than renters to share some of that economic burden. Um, so, you know, what we need to be calling for is 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 a, a way of of cancelling cancelling that rent debt. I'm yet to see a com you know a variety of things have been brought forward, and I'm yet to see a policy which I'm finding utterly convincing. We've only really got one one month to campaign for it, unless unless the government extends um, extends the, the stay again, which they might do. Um, but yeah, now now the now I think the discussion needs to really be focusing on, on what to do about rent debt. I'll stop there, Heather. Hopefully that's comprehensive. Thanks very much for that, Joe. Um, we've had quite a few questions about rent control. So um, I was wondering, Joe, whether or not you could just very quickly summarise for us what is meant by rent control and um, say a little bit about whether or not you think that that's something that we can and should be pushing for in this particular political moment as well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so rent, rent controls um, are a, um, uh, so at the, at the moment, you know, broadly speaking, like the rent in, uh, rent in the private rented sector in the UK is set by the market. So whatever a landlord wants to charge for a property, they can do. Uh, a, a control on rent would be a regulation which dictates like how much a landlord can charge on rent. There's, you know, hundreds of different forms of rent controls and ways of setting rent controls. At NEF we did a piece of research for the Mayor of London last year looking at what a rent control might look like uh, for London. The UK did have a long-standing uh, system of rent controls which we still have in some properties, a very minority of properties in the UK, um, but uh, that, that, that with the modern private rent sector that's, that's largely got, gone away. We, sh we should absolutely be campaigning for rent, co rent controls. I think we're highly unlikely to get them under, under, if we're honest, under a Tory government because, you know, there's, there's fewer bigger red flags to the Tory bull than, than, than rent control and, and, and the kind of um, meddling in the market that that represents. But, you know, within a pandemic that with, within recent policies, there is an opportunity for rent control because if the government increases local housing allowance or housing benefit in order to um, in order to help more people pay their rent or in order to pay more of people, more of lower income people's rents, then that, you know, presents an opportunity for landlords just to increase rents to capture um, that housing benefit. If the government will pay £500 as opposed to £400, why wouldn't a landlord increase their rent to £500? And so, you know, you couldn't, we could make an argument for rent controls based on increases in housing benefit, which have already happened. Whether they would, you know, land, I don't know. But, and also to prevent us from getting into this situation again in, in the future, if rents in the UK were more, more affordable, if we had a, had a sensible and controlled system of, of, of rents, then we wouldn't have such an enormous problem of rent debt as we do now. Brilliant. Very comprehensive, Joe. Thank you very much for that. Um, okay, we're going to move on to our second speaker, um, Nabila Molam, who is a member of Sheffield, the Sheffield branch of Acorn. Um, Nabila, can you talk us through a little bit about your experience as a renter and some of the tactics that Acorn have been using during the pandemic? Yeah, 
so I thought I'd start by telling a little bit about my own housing experience and then probably going to like what how acorns sort of fit into the picture. Um, please do excuse me, I'm just recovering from a really bad cold, so I hope I sound all right. Um, but I moved to Sheffield a number of years ago with my mum, who was an international student at Sheffield Hallam Uni. And this was my first time living away, so to speak. And honestly, nothing could have prepared me for it. The first apartment we rented was nothing like it was advertised. It was a lot further away from the university. There were no provisions to do your laundry. The heating didn't really work. And on top of that, there were all these really exorbitant charges on top of the rent, even though it was meant to be all inclusive. Um, obviously not being from the UK, I wasn't very familiar with the housing law in the country. So when the landlord was very hostile, we didn't really know who to turn to or that you know we could turn to somebody. And when we said we were leaving and he wouldn't return our deposit, I didn't really know that I could do anything about it. And just after this, we moved into our second house. And it wasn't a whole lot better, but it was definitely a step up from the first one. So there were still, you know, holes in the floor. The furniture was literally falling apart. And the shower was temperamental. It's probably the best word to describe it. And yet, after seven years of living there, our landlord sent us an eviction notice under Section 21 of the Housing Act. Um, and I think the previous speaker very nicely sort of summarised what Section 21 was. But, you know, even though we'd been essentially like the perfect tenants, didn't bother him whatsoever, it was absolutely fine for him to evict us. And for us, this came at one of the worst possible times. We had no savings to put down a huge deposit and we couldn't find another house within our budget. And I think there was definitely a period where we thought we were going to end up homeless. Um, but I know this isn't just my story or my experience. This is the experience of thousands of renters from across the country. And I think especially with the pandemic, with so many people having lost their jobs or having lost some form of income, um, or you know, especially like those on a reduced income, it's just not a feasible way to live, especially for a nation that, you know, where most of us are one paycheck away from homelessness. This definitely has a very significant impact. And I'm not sure how many people are familiar with ACORN, but for those of you who don't know, um, ACORN is a union for the community, a little bit like a trade union is for the workplace. And we're all about, you know, uniting people to claim my economic rights. Um, and I think we've sort of best become known for our housing activism work because that's what a lot of our campaigns have been on. But in reality, we are a lot more broader issue, so to speak. Um, we know we've only just started, but we've already won absolutely loads. We forced NatWest and TSB to drop their no DSS clause. We fought for and won landlord licensing in Bristol, Sheffield and Newcastle. We've won sprinklers in a tower block in Newcastle. We made VOLIA clean up the streets in Sheffield. We forced Santander to drop their rent rise clause. We forced Bristol City Council to drop a four million council tax rise for the poorest. Um, and of course, you know, we've won back dozens of repairs, we've stopped dozens of evictions, and we've won back dozens of stolen deposits for our members. And really, we did all of this by knocking on our members' doors, um, knocking on our neighbourhood doors, really, calling up members of the community and just bringing people together. And, you know, like lots of other groups, um, ACORN have been taking action to, you know, push the government to come up with a real long-term solution to prevent a homelessness crisis because of COVID. Because, you know, we want them to legislate against rent debt and change the unfair laws that make it so easy for landlords to evict, like, any tenant, regardless of personal circumstances or even, like, a global or national situation. And obviously we are pleased to see that the eviction ban has been extended. But I think to us this is very much a sticking plaster. It doesn't really address any real issues. Um, it doesn't address any of the factors that could still lead to homelessness or huge debts for tenants. So we held a day of action around across 17 towns and cities. Um, it was just this weekend. So we mobilised hundreds of people because we know the laws aren't fit for purpose and the extension is an opportunity for us to sort of get them changed once and for all. 
So specifically, we are calling for the abolition of Section 21 no fault evictions and a rented debt waiver. And we also want an amendment of Section 8 of the Housing Act. So it's to prevent landlords from filing for eviction for anyone who might come under rent arrears. Uh, because I think under Section 21, you've got to have reason to evict them that is seen as legitimate in the eyes of the law and rent arrears is one of them. Um, if no action is taken by the government to ensure protection from eviction, then ACORN is ready to prevent evictions on the street from the 20th of September. So we've set up community protection teams across the country and it's made up of people who, you know, don't have any sort of like extraordinary qualification. It's just our members who we've come together, we've trained um, ourselves really, and we're ready to resist evictions if it comes to it. Because, you know, we know that housing is a right and not a privilege, but we also know that rights aren't always given. Sometimes they are fought for and won. And I think for me, I joined ACORN because I didn't just want to hear about a housing revolution. I wanted to be a part of it. And, you know, there's no doubt that there is a housing crisis in this country. And with the current generation of young people being the biggest generation of renters this country has ever seen. And with the working class having to bear the brunt of the pandemic, I think secure housing is the least we deserve. Uh, but that's more or less a summary of my own experience, why I joined ACORN and what ACORN is all about. But if anyone has any questions, um, I'd be more than happy to take them. Brilliant. Thanks very much for that, Nabila. Um, and I'm really grateful to you for sharing your own personal experience and sharing what I'm sure must have been a really kind of stressful and, and traumatic experience at times. Um, and also for that very rousing call to action. Uh, we've had one question that came through email, which I'd like to put to you now, if that's OK. Yeah. Um, so Acorn has used door knocking really effectively to build community power. Um, why do you think that face-to-face -face conversations are so important and how have you made this work under COVID? I think as a nation, we've, I think because the laws have been in this place for like so long, because housing conditions have been so poor for so long, because the housing crisis has just been building up, I do think we've almost become used to accepting things as they are. Um, and obviously we've always had groups fighting back. and. and a lot of the times like when I've knocked on the door and like you have a chat with somebody the first response is oh it's fine like everything's fine I mean we just sort of make do really like yes it's a bit of a struggle don't always have a lot of money left like a week before payday but you know you just make do don't you um and it's trying to like get the idea across that actually you sh like it isn't normal for someone to be working 60 hours a week but still not having enough money to make rent it's not normal for people to be paying over half their paycheck to a landlord you never see, even when you need something. And having that sort of conversation, it almost helps you, A, sort of figure out what it is that they need support with. Because as a community union, we exist to serve our members' needs, really. But also getting the point across that the only reason we are so strong is because we have power in numbers and that none of us are especially trained or have like this incredible lots of a knowledge it is very much ordinary people coming together um, and sharing the little bit of resource and the little bit of knowledge that we do have to make sure that we're there for each other and we're there for ourselves so i think that's why it's worked for us in terms of covid um so we also do phone banking and we've definitely relied on phone banking a lot more i think as sort of like lockdown measures um, are easing and depending on how safe it is for members, we probably will be moving to door knocking eventually, possibly a few months from now rather than right away. But I don't think the pandemic has stopped us from like coming together or if anything, it's really stressed the need for people to still find ways to come together, whether that's online, whether that's over the phone or whether that's setting up community groups to just check in on your neighbours who might not be able to physically be there. Um, but I hope that answers the question. That's fantastic, Nabila. Um, thank you so much. Yeah, that experience of talking yeah. to renters and actually um, 
renters having really low expectations of, of their housing and the need to kind of raise people's expectations really kind of chimes with my own experience of, um, of speaking to renters. Um, thank you so much um, for that. That was really, really useful. Um, just before we move on to our next speaker, then I just wanted to give a quick shout out to all the NEF supporters who are on the call. Um, your generosity is really helping to fund our response to this crisis. Um, and that includes being able to run briefings like this. So I just wanted to say thank you very much. Uh, if you're not a NEF supporter and you would like to become one, then please do look on the supporters um, network page on our website. And we're going to be posting a link to that in the chat now. Okay, so let's move on to our next speaker, Izzy Kurtzel, who is a member of Housing Action Southwark and Lambeth. Um, Izzy, Hassel, Hassel has been fighting evictions um, for very, very many years before the pandemic. Could you tell us a little bit about how Hassel, um, about the work that Hassel do and your experience in fighting evictions? Sorry. I'm unmuted myself. So, um, Hassel is a local community group made up of people directly affected by housing problems. Um, and we support each other on these problems and we campaign for the high quality council housing that we need. Um, most of our members are in temporary accommodation or they're in severely overcrowded private rented housing. And so these are some of the most precarious housing situations you can be in. They have some, these are, you have the fewest rights in these housing situations. And so the threat of eviction has been a very real threat for all of our members. Um, over, over seven years so yeah we've gained a lot of experience in dealing with these issues um, so the eviction ban was definitely a relief for lots of our members it was one less thing to worry about it was important because it shows we can ban evictions and society kind of carried on it was fine um, but still um, it's not the answer the only answer to the housing crisis because for our members the eviction ban was there it was a bit of a relief but they still ha had all these other housing problems to be dealing with like bullying landlords disrepair overcrowded conditions and so yeah the eviction ban isn't one solution but it was definitely a relief um, for people reflecting the people worst affected by the housing crisis our member is our, our group is made up of migrant women of color and their families and many members don't speak English as a first language so in our meetings we have people translating um, Spanish and we have Arabic speakers and Somali speakers um, and so yeah so it's an approach of mutual support and collective action um, and we build campaigns and we win so I have quite a few links of things that um, I'm hoping to post up so one of our wins recently was a legal and campaign victory against Lambeth Council and we were defending homeless people's rights and so we've got a blog post about that and a leaflet and there's another link of the London Coalition Against Poverty booklet which explains a little bit about our approach of mutual support and collective action um, I just wanted to say three things that might be obvious to people but also might be helpful to think about our current situation and how we organize um, so one of the things I wanted to say is that there's a lot of focus about around people not being able to pay their rent because of COVID-19 and I think it's really important to remember that people in, in London and across the country have been struggling to pay their rent they've been struggling falling into rent arrears and they've been being evicted and this has been a daily reality for the poorest renters for the last for over the decade of housing benefit cuts and austerity we've faced um, so the benefit cap particularly, and then the shared accommodation rate cut housing benefit for young people. And this has caused masses of evictions across London and the country. And it's also these, these lower housing benefit rates has also forced people into severely overcrowded housing because that's the only housing that they can afford. Um, under the new, the lowered housing benefit rates. And we've got a video that some of our members have made about their overcrowding um, un under COVID and living in severely overcrowded homes under COVID. So hopefully we can share that. But, um, and so th these people have been suffering the housing crisis long, long before COVID. And it's really important that their demands and their needs um, are forefronted and that they feel supported to take action without the work falling on their shoulders. And it's also important that there isn't a whitewashing of the housing crisis by people who are facing housing precarity and insecurity for the first time when this has been the reality for people um, for, for years and years. 
Um, the second thing, so yeah, I guess just putting it into some context, there is an evictions crisis, but that was on top of this wider homelessness crisis that people have been facing in London, um, due, especially due to the benefit cap and other housing benefit cuts. The second point I wanted to, that I think it's important to talk about, is that eviction resistance is not an end goal and it's not the only tactic. All it can do is buy some time and it has to be part of a bigger plan. I think that sometimes there's this, it's easy to get excited or to romanticize eviction resistance and to think about building barriers and blocking bailiffs but actually you want to intervene as soon as possible as early as possible in this process and actually it's the unglamorous work of helping people with housing benefit claims making sure their universal credit is okay um, and so yeah in Hassel I think we've probably stopped hundreds of people from being evicted but it's simply from people knowing their rights knowing that a section 21 doesn't mean you have to leave then and um, getting lawyers like lots of different things that that aren't maybe as exciting or but um, but they're really really important and they go they often go on behind the scenes um, but that's absolutely vital. Um, and the third thing is that eviction resistance isn't always the right solution for everybody as well. In Hassel, due to the discrimination in the private rented sector that many of our members face, so private landlords are racist. We know they don't want to rent to you probably because of the colour of your skin or if you don't speak English. Um, they don't accept benefits. If you have children, they, they don't want to rent to you. And this has led to our members being housed in some of the worst housing because they have no other choice but to rent from the only landlord that will accept them. Um, and so actually sometimes being evicted and following a homeless duty actually sees an improvement in their housing conditions because sometimes the temporary accommodation from the cat that they get from the council is actually better. So it's important that it's not this eviction resistance isn't necessarily the right solution for everybody so there's lots of hassle members where actually doing um being evicted and having a homeless duty difficult incredibly difficult though it is it's it, it sees an improvement in their living conditions um i'll just speak about some of the tactics and ways that we've stopped evictions supported people to stop evictions um, as I said, it's really important to support people as early on in the process as possible. Um, we, have a, we have regular group meetings where pe members come, they work on their cases, they listen to each other. We have a mantra, so lots of hassle people, they, they really know their rights from coming to our regular meetings. So they know if they have problems with rent arrears, they must get help immediately. Um, so yeah, they'll come to the group and speak to us. So they have a really good knowledge of their rights and how to deal with issues and they feel really supported to do that. So we're able to spot any potential issues really early on and, and deal with them before it becomes a bigger problem. And so just having this support network with regular meetings is really important. Um, at the start of lockdown, we knew people's incomes would be affected. So we were sending reminders to them about if your income changes, you need to tell your benefits, you need to update housing benefits and make sure you're getting the right payments. Um, and another tactic is just making sure people are able to access uh, lawyers and advice services. Um, so at this, in lockdown, uh, one of our members came to us, her, um, her universal credit had been wrongfully stopped and she'd had no income during lockdown. So she was in huge rent arrears already. And we helped get her a lawyer who was able to take on her case and he got her a £7,500 back payment of universal credit, which paid her rent arrears. So she was no longer at threat of being evicted for rent arrears. Um, Usually uh, legal aid for welfare issues is completely non-existent, um, which is part, part of the problem that we're facing. Um, but in this case, they were able to they're able to help and that stopped her from being evicted. Another family got an accelerated possession order. This is before COVID. They didn't qualify for legal aid, but we're in Costa Coffee. We helped them fill out the defense form. Um, it involves emailing with housing officers about rent, uh, rent arrears and repayment plans. And you do this so regularly that you get to know them quite well. And um, you can apply for a universal credit crisis loan, which is actually really efficient. So we helped one member with really big rent arrears was faced with eviction. We got the universal crisis loan the day, the day after and that, that helped. And we liaised with the housing officer and the eviction was called off. Um, like landlords make up their own court papers. We help, we help our members identify it when they've made up, they've got mistakes in their section 21s. They've made up their own claim forms. They come up with all sorts of tricks. We help people understand this and know their rights. We've attended court with people um, for moral support. We've helped them get lawyers to take their, to challenge section 21s in court. Um, We've done a protest, so there's another link that I can post about um, two homeless women who were both survivors of domestic violence. Um, and if you're a single person, you don't get automatic help 
from the council if you're homeless. So the council was saying these women weren't vulnerable enough to qualify for homeless help and they were going to end their homeless duty and they're threatening to evict them onto the streets. And so we did a protest um, at Southwark Town Hall to highlight their issues and to call for them to stop the eviction. We got really close with one of the councillors who was, who was coming on our side and then the housing manager withdrew that and so actually the, the woman was evicted. Um, and this is why it, where it's more complicated because she was living in a hostel. And so if you live in a hostel, you don't have as many rights, but you, know, that you don't need to have a court order to be evicted. They can just change the locks when you're not there. So for her particular situation, she didn't feel able to resist eviction. It wasn't, wasn't an option for her. So she was evicted, but the other woman actually was made an offer of private housing, um, which she accepted and which, um, which helped in her situation. But so, yeah, we do these public protests. We've done quite a few Twitter storms when families have been evic uh, threatened with eviction from temporary accommodation, tweeting at councillors. So we've stopped a number of evictions that way. And we have done a number of physical eviction resistances, but this is again, quite a while ago. Um, and since then the group has grown so much, but we've done fewer eviction resistances. And I think this shows the success that actually we've been able to help people a lot earlier on. Um, but yeah, we did an eviction at Dorchester Court in Lambeth in 2016 now. Um, and again, that was a bit of a funny situation. I think the woman, she was doing a homeless application with the council and she was kind of okay with the situation. I think she was just a bit angry with her landlord. So she wanted to resist the eviction just to sort of show him and she was making tea for the bailiffs. Um, so that was kind of a more symbolic event. It was a little bit strange, but she was keen on it. Um, and then we did another eviction resistance um, where actually the bailiffs gave a false time. They gave the time they were coming, they didn't turn up. So everybody actually went away. And then we saw the police arrive and there were only a few of us left at that stage. And we're like, oh no, wait, the bailiffs are coming. Like they're just coming late. They've just given us the wrong time. And what was really strange is that Afua Hirsch and the journalist turned up and started filming. She actually helped three of us block the bailiffs until more people could be gathered back. But there's a tip. If the bailiffs give you a time, they don't turn up. Don't go away, hang around a little bit longer because they might return. And it was Afua Hirsch and, who stopped that eviction. So she, she is awesome. And um, yeah, the, the eviction resistance is these physical are actually very stressful they should be a last resort they're quite unsustainable um, and I guess another eviction resistant thing we thing that we do um, is we campaign for the high quality council housing um, especially three four five bed family council homes um, that we need and it gives us that greater security so we're not faced with homelessness we don't have to deal with bullying exploitative private landlords council housing acts as a form of rent control as well if there's enough council housing the private landlords have a lot less leverage but um, in our group in Hassel, every single meeting, we talk about council housing. People are bidding on council housing, where each week on their, their housing register accounts, there's one family council home for the whole borough. And so this is, this is like the, the key for, for Hassel, our demand is three, four, five bed family council homes, because that gives us the security we need and deserve. And they have to be high quality too. We're not just demanding council housing, like we want really good, high quality council housing, especially after everything people have been through in lockdown and how you think about your home and your housing conditions so much more than usual. We should be really imaginative, like we want massive balconies so we can hang out, like just let's get really good council housing. So I'll finish up because I'm sure I should be, but um, it's the inadequate welfare system, the racist rules, the, the lack of rights for private renters and the lack of social housing um, that are the root causes. These were the root causes of the housing crisis before COVID-19. Um, so our demands, I got quite excited and carried away thinking of demands, um, but I'll, I'll be a bit selective. So of course, like in Hassel, our mantra is three, four, five bed council housing. Um, but also, yeah, no, it has to be, that has to be joined. And I hope uh, we'll hear more about this from Jane. It has to be joined with no recourse to public funds because we can't continue a racist housing system where some people are denied from it. So three, four, five bed council housing. Uh, no and no recourse to public funds and the benefit cap should be so important to everything we do because the benefit cap has affected um, women and young children and disabled people and the benefit cap was a highly popular policy and we need that to be we need to reverse that so people know how nasty the benefit cap is and how it made people homeless how it's caused great hardship um, and then th there's lots of other like simple things and the five week wait for universal credit. There's rent arrears now because people are making universal credit claims and they're not getting them to for five weeks. That could immediately solve uh, lots of rent arrears problems. Of course, it's time to ban section 21. It's time to scrap ground eight. People need legal aid so they can get proper welfare and housing advice. We need to make empty homes council homes, right? Right across London, tons of empty housing across the country. And um, council should CPO them and make them into luxury 
council housing. Um, and so, yeah, those are some of my demands. I'm sure I've missed anything. And so maybe I'll be able to add them at another point. Brilliant. Thanks very much for that, Izzy. Um, and really helpfully, Izzy's pulled together some really, really fantastic resources including some of the stuff that she mentioned so examples of actions and pamphlets on building mutual support and organizing in your community we're going to share a link to those in the chat box now um, unfortunately we're running about five ten minutes behind um, so we're not going to have um, we're going to move on to the next speaker if there are questions for Izzy then we um, will hopefully find some time at the end um, Thanks again, Izzy. Uh, really appreciate your time and really appreciate you setting out actually what the limitations of eviction resistance are. I think that's really important. Um, okay, we're going to move on to our next speaker, um, Jane Williams, who is founder and CEO of the Magpie Project. Um, Jane, lots of people who you work with are in really, really appalling, unsafe, temporary accommodation. Um, and many of them have no recourse to public funds, as Izzy mentioned. Um, can you talk about what it's like organising with people in this incredibly vulnerable situation? And um, what tactics have you been using and how does this all intersect with race and migration? Yeah, thank you very much for having me, Izzy. I'm just so on board with what you were saying. Thank you so much. I feel really excited and giddy after listening to you. Um, so um, we are an organisation based in Newham in East London, where one in 12 children are homeless and there are 2,000 under fives who are homeless or in temporary accommodation. We work with mums with children under five. 80% of our mums have no recourse to public funds. Um, so some of our mums are on the call uh, now, but the reason that I'm speaking instead of them is, is, uh, is really enlightening. So I'm speaking because I've got childcare. It's seven o'clock in the evening, like, uh, hi Rukiet, Stephanie, none of these people have got childcare. Um, I'm speaking because I've got internet access. Lots of national asylum seeker accommodation doesn't have internet access. I've got a computer, I'm not hungry. I've had enough to eat today. I've slept last night because I'm not sharing a room the size of a parking space with three children. Um, I am able to speak up because it won't affect my immigration claim. I'm not worried about affecting my immigration claim by speaking up. Um, I'm able to speak up because I'm not going to be evicted for speaking up. One of our members, um, the Huffington Post, came round in the afternoon um, and had a camera with them. The um, Clear Spring building manager uh, came into the building. She was evicted that night. She was told to leave the property. She had to go and live somewhere else. With no uh, migrant help didn't do anything about it. So that's, this is the very real worry that our members have when they speak up. Um, I'm not worried that my children are gonna be taken away or that social workers are gonna tell me that I'm not cooperating with them. Um, I, have legal redress. Um, a lot of uh, people um, who, d who are undocumented don't have legal redress. Uh, so they're very open to financial and physical and every kind of abuse. Um, people say, whose passport are the police going to be looking for? Ring the police, go on. Um, and um, even if it's not 100% the case that, uh, that they're, you know, they're not here illegally, they're going through a legal process, um, you know, the worry is very real. Um, so, you know, um, also I've got the emotional bandwidth. I'm not in the middle of trauma. I, I, I'm not fleeing domestic violence. I know where my next meal is coming from. So I think these are all the reasons. And in a room like this as well, you know, English is my first language and I'm not going to be accused of being over emotional Arabic woman or, uh, uh, or an angry black woman or, uh, you know, so, so these are all the reasons why um, hi, my mums. I know you're on the call, but this is why I'm speaking <laughs> instead of them. And organising with them um, is, is, is really interesting because they have no rights. They're not renters. They're not tenants. Um, they are six uh, subcontractions away from um, the people who are paying the bill. So, you know, they go through migrant, if, they, if they're in NAS accommodation, they go through migrant help, they go through um, uh, Clear Spring, they go through Ready Homes. You know, they can't get to the person who is making the decision. Nobody is taking responsibility for their repairs. Um, so they can't withdraw their money and go somewhere else. 
um, you know, they're stuck. Uh, so um, in terms of what doesn't work, what doesn't work, advocating on renters' rights doesn't work because uh, mums aren't tenants. Um, uh, specific asks don't really work. Uh, we think they do. So uh, I'll just give you a little time scale. We complained about bed and breakfasts for families in Newham. Uh, so, so they stopped. Um, Newham stopped placing uh, families in bed and breakfasts, but instead they just sent them to Bradford straight away, like that, overnight. Gave them a key, a train kit, sometimes when they had a three day old baby. So that didn't work. So we're like, no, that's not quite what we meant. Uh, can you stop sending people to Bradford? And they're like, yeah, okay. So then they put them in the Holiday Inn with no cooking facilities, no fridges to keep their babies milking, uh, no way to even have breakfast without leaving the house and paying enormous amounts in cafes and so on to eat. Um, so we're like, no, 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 that's not quite what we meant. We want self-contained properties for families. We don't want shared properties. So, uh, so then they said, okay, right, okay. So uh, we'll put them in containers or ex-office blocks on roundabouts in Harlow, industrial estates. So I think it's really important to look at the whole picture and, 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 and say that what our families need are communities. They don't need housing units. They're not units to be housed. They need proper communities. And I love the idea of luxury um, uh, council houses, that's brilliant. My friend's just moved to Europe and she said that's exactly what they've got. They've got pools, they've got balconies, it's beautiful. Uh, so what does work? Collective action, so being a magpie mum really works. Um, our mums ring social workers and housing officers, they mention the magpie project and suddenly the conversation changes because there's some collective power there. Um, they can't pick us off one by one. Stories help, um, stories on Twitter help. I get messages uh, from councillors saying, please stop tweeting. I've been called into meetings saying, not saying how do we improve housing, saying how do we stop you tweeting? What can we do to stop you tweeting? And so, so we'll do your job, that'd be fine. Um, we, uh, use our, we use mums with lived experience to liaise with social services and uh, provision uh, to tell them, you know, mom, our mums are the experts in what's needed. Um, so anybody creating housing provision needs to talk to them about what, you know, they're the end user of what they're producing. We work with Shelter, Project 17, Hackney Migrant Centre, Health Visitors, London Black Women's Project. Um, and we were very successful in bringing a complaint against the um, council for aggressively gatekeeping Section 17 support. Um, and now we have sort of three monthly meetings with um, the No Recourse team uh, to make sure that uh, there was an independent social worker review, the eight complaints were upheld, uh, they changed their policies, they changed all their communication, there was a staffing rejig, so we just, we're just making sure that they're carrying on doing that. We're going to use some of our mums to train the frontline social workers in how to act with them. Um, and um, collective legal action. We're doing something around NAS at the moment, around clear spring housing, um, but it's really important that we protect the individual mums um, because they could so easily be picked off and they're so vulnerable. Uh, they don't have legal redress, they don't have financial redress, they don't have contractual redress, so we have to be really, really careful. And we also hold our community to account and say, in your community, in your street, these people are living, what are you doing about it? So my asks, everything that Izzy said, please. Um, also, I think that we have to be really um, careful that we, um, that it's not just about reforming and regulating the market. Um, the market's not broken. The market's doing exactly what markets do. It's, it's doing it brilliantly. It's, it's creating and delivering profits for shareholders. It's doing great. It's not broken. Um, um, read Mir's annual report to find out how well the market is working for them. So my question is, will reform it, reforming it ever be enough, especially for those who are not economically active? They're not economic units. Um, 
they don't have consumer or renter rights. So I think we need a lot of non-market community solutions. And like as he says, the, the biggest buffer to that is building council homes. Um, I think as well, we've got a real opportunity with COVID. You know, COVID was a national emergency and look what was achieved. I went to uh, the housing offices and they got all of our mums out of shared accommodation into self-contained accommodation because of COVID. You know, everybody came off the streets, no evictions. Why isn't housing a national emergency? Why is COVID a national emergency and not housing? Why don't we just say, look, homelessness is a national emergency. It's a public health issue. Let's carry on with the emergency footing until, it's, until we've done that. So spend evictions, write off accumulated debt, abolish no recourse. Um, I think there's something really important around women fleeing domestic violence um, and women looking after children. Uh, they need to be at the top of any list. There needs to be ring-fenced, um, good quality housing for them. Um, and then this is going to be really unpopular. I'm sorry, Heather, I'm sorry. I'm going to say it. Um, triage. So I think that, you know, for the most in need, uh, get there first. So I would say hand over the housing lists to, um, you know, for the homeless. Solve that first and then move on to the rest, you know. Um, yeah, sorry about that, guys. I know that that's probably not popular, but um, meh. <laughs> Thank you. Jane, that was absolutely fantastic. Um, that was, it was really, really inspiring to hear about you and the Mag Magpie, Magpie Mums agitating and, and shaming the council um, over their absolutely appalling practices. Um, that was, yeah, that was really, really amazing. Uh, I, I feel a bit speechless. Um, okay, we're gonna move on to our final speaker. We're running short of time. Um, Sean Cass is Secretary of the Edinburgh Member Defence Team of Living Rent in Scotland. Um, Sean, welcome to the call. Um, can you give us a bit of context on what's happening in Scotland? Because I know the situation there is a little bit different. And talk us through Living Rent strategy so far. Um, and what's, what's the plan? Because I know you've done quite a lot of stuff already on resisting evictions. Yes, I think it's, um, it's quite interesting when you compare the rest of the UK to Scotland. Uh, where the Scottish Government has actually extended the eviction ban further um, to March 2021. Um, but we know the reality of that is that that's not, a, that's not a solution. You know, in Scotland, we've simply kicked the can even further down the road um, than, than the rest of the, um, the UK. Um, and what we're already starting to see is the, the effect of that, the effect of um, kicking the can down the road um, without putting in place any real solutions. And so what we are starting to see is, you know, landlords are getting restless. They don't want to wait until March to start, um, you know, for their investments to start returning um, a, a profit again. Um, so as one example of, of many, um, we've had, um, you know, over, over the last couple of weeks, we had one of our, our, our members locked out by the landlord and a threat to sell all the belongings to, uh, to make up for their, um, their COVID related rent arrears. Um, so it's um, this is going to uh, that's a, a situation that's going to be repeated over and over again up and down the um, up and down the country. So in many ways and for many people the, the picture is quite bleak. Um, but actually, um, what I've seen um, working in the member defence team with living uh, with living rent um, has given me massive hope for what's um, for what's coming. Um, our membership increases every day, um, and it's not just people signing up to be members, it's people signing up to fight, uh, it's people find it, uh, signing up to get involved uh, and to make a, uh, you know, are really determined to make a real, a real difference, uh, because I think people are really starting to realise um, what the, um, you know, what the, the big problems are um, and uh, in, in society. So just, you know, looking forward to, uh, to what we're focusing um, on. Um, there's kind of two main things. Um, number one, we're focusing on um, the member defence work and defending individual, um, individual members. Um, so as a, a small example, going back to the, uh, the member who was um, illegally evicted from the, from the property at short notice, uh, from the home at short notice. Um, despite all of the COVID restrictions, um, we put together a small team 
um, who went to the landlord's house and place of business um, and demanded a meeting with the, um, with the, with the landlord. Um, we had members sitting at, phone, uh, at home, jamming the phone lines of the, uh, of the business. We demanded the meeting um, and we were successful in, um, in achieving, um, uh, in achieving um, compensation and a fair outcome for, the, uh, for a member. Um, but that leads into other things. So those um, wins for individual um, tenants, um, they build power massively. And um, so what we've not only seen is that now the people who were in, uh, the member who was involved in that, he's supporting other members because he now has the confidence um, to to take these things uh, to take things on and to support um, to support other members. Um, we're using it to build awareness of the um, of the problems because it's not um, it can't be enough for the only people to be worried about these things to be the people who are directly affected. Um, there needs to be an awareness that these issues exist for change to come uh, for change to come along. And linked into that, um, we've got a fantastic opportunity in Scotland um, with the the, uh, the Scottish Parliament elections coming up in in, in May 2021, um, to hold our elected representatives to uh, to account. You know, things are are coming together at the um, at the same uh, at the same time. So we'll be challenging um, our elected representatives, and especially those who are in government, um, because our current government were elected on the basis that um, that they would introduce rent controls and have done nothing for four years. They've been kicking the can down the down the road uh, and doing nothing about it. This was a pre-existing issue, not a COVID uh, a COVID issue. Um, but what we're going to be doing is we're going to be using our collective voice, uh, but we're going to be targeting um, our representatives locally. And um, we're going to be uh, our local branches are going to be. Um, are, are going to be approaching the local representatives, the local MSPs, uh, and looking them in the eye, taking real examples like the one I've just mentioned, um, and asking them what they're going to do, why they've let uh, renters down in this way, why they've broken their promises, and what they're going to do this time uh, this time around. Um, so I think just coming back to the um, uh, so just coming back to the um, to, to the hope. Um, we are, um, I think that the thing that we've really been focusing on is, um, you know, going back to that example where I gave, where we've made a real difference to that member's, um, that member's life. There was nothing in there that was difficult. It wasn't experienced campaigners involved in it. It wasn't, um, it wasn't um, you know, well-trained lawyers who won that compensation. Um, it was members, most of them who have joined in the last couple of months, coming together, um, to support um, fellow um, fellow members, um, and I think that's a really powerful uh, a, a really powerful thing. So my kind of call to uh, call to action: any of you who you know might be sitting on this call, you know, there's lots of activists here, but maybe there's people who aren't involved. Get involved. There's really simple things that you could do. You know, it might just be that you're the person sitting on the end of the phone, jamming the phone line, and um, you know. There's loads that you can you can do even if you don't have any experience in it. So sign up, join. Brilliant, Sean. Thank you so much for that. It was really, really good to hear about some um, practical tactics that you can use to disrupt landlords' businesses. And um, yeah, we're going to post a link to the chat now if people are calling from Scotland about how you can get involved in, in living rent. Um, I mean, one of the themes that's really coming out is, is like what's working is people supporting people. It's not necessarily about kind of relying on experts. Um, okay, so that's, that's pretty much all the, the time that we've got this evening. Um, I just wanted to leave you by kind of reinforcing what Sean said um, and anyone who isn't already involved in a local group or, or union, please do get involved. Uh, it's, it's only, as we've heard tonight, right, it is only through collectivising and taking action that we're going to force landlords, councils, central government out of their comfort zone. And it's only through forcing them out of their comfort zone that we're going to get them to redress the power imbalance, which allows people to be evicted and allows people to live in places that damage their health. Um, lovely. Okay, so... 
also yeah we're gonna we've, we've posted links where you can join hassle and, and other housing groups if you've got any questions and uh, about the groups tonight and you don't know how to get in touch with them then please do let us know and we'll link you up um thanks so much to everyone for joining uh, i i really really hope this session has helped people to think through some of the tactics that we need to use that can help us to keep people in their homes get them into better homes um and help us fight uh, evictions politically and practically um, and once again I really encourage those of you who are not involved to, to get involved stay safe and have a really great week